Hello, welcome to the Friday, June 7th, 2019 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. I noted a couple times talking about Blue Keep and the RDP vulnerability in general that you probably shouldn't expose RDP to the public internet. Latest example of why this is a bad idea is a botnet that Renato came across and he called it Gold Brute based on a Java library that it uses to actually do its scanning. This botnet is actually a little bit more intricate than some of these botnets. First of all, it's written in Java, which is a little bit unusual and comes with the entire Java runtime. So the download for each individual host is about 80 megabytes in size. And that's the zipped archive of everything that's then being expanded on the infected host. Now, once a host is infected, it starts scanning for other systems that have an open RDP port and it reports this back to a command control server. Now, once it reported back, 80 IP addresses, then this command and control server will actually start pushing IP address back to the RDP host. I think uh, there's a little bit of proof that uh, this host is actually actively scanning and not just a honeypot. So that may be the reason that it first wants these 80 IP addresses back and then the host, the command control server is pushing back more IP addresses that the infected system is is then scanning for a weak password. Each time the host is just using one pair of username and password. So that probably will work around some lockout uh, issues here. And uh, then later it will receive another list of IP addresses. Renato, of course, well, uh, he did send back 80 IP addresses, got back more and more addresses to scan. Overall, he ended up with about 1.5 million servers that are exposed according to this botnet. So these 1.5 million servers are now being scanned for a week passwords. And of course, this list is going to get larger as infected systems are scanning for more and more hosts that have RDP exposed. Shodan lists a total of 2.4 million exposed servers. So this botnet is getting close to reaching all RDP servers that are exposed. Aside from just scanning and infecting systems, it's not really clear what the next move will be here. But of course, with this command control infrastructure, it's not too hard then for an attacker to actually upload additional malware to these systems. The usernames and passwords that are successful in breaching systems are of course being reported back to the command and control server. The communication between infected hosts and the command and control server actually uses web sockets and is AES encrypted with a static key that's included in the malware. More details, code snippets, and some of the IP addresses of the command control host and the like uh, you'll find in Renato's diary. We reported yesterday the host that is distributing the malware to the ISP hosting it, uh, but at this point, the host is sadly still available. And then we got a critical vulnerability in the XM mail server. And now this vulnerability is trivial to exploit for local users. They essentially just have to send an email to the command they're trying to execute. So this is not like a buffer overflow or something like this. This is sort of one of these command inclusion vulnerabilities where a command that's being transmitted here as part of the email address is directly being executed. It's also remotely executable, but uh, that's a little bit more tricky in order to remotely exploit this vulnerability. An attacker has to keep the connection open for seven days. So has to transmit that email really, really slowly. And then this exploit may still work. I guess a stupid workaround here is to just reboot your XM servers once a day. But uh, I would just recommend you probably better go ahead and patch. And mobile security company Wondera took a look at how iOS applications 
are taking advantage or not taking advantage of TLS encryption. In 2016, I believe, uh, Apple actually had a deadline uh, proposed where all applications had to use TLS exclusively. Well, uh, this didn't work out. Developers sort of pushed back. So Bandera took a look at uh, what applications are currently doing. Now, Apple calls this feature App Transport Security, and you can define a policy for your application, but then you can override it in particular functions and features to essentially not use a TLS, even if your application does use sort of TLS by default. What Vendera actually found is that about two thirds of applications have an ATS disabled completely, about a third have enabled, and uh, a couple of percent are taking the more granular approach where they're sort of doing it based on a particular function. This looks a bit different for paid versus free. About 46% of paid applications have ATS enabled globally and 26% of free applications do the same. And that's sort of what it really comes down to is that apparently for a lot of sort of the user tracking and at delivery, ATS is often not enabled. Mandera also suggests that ATS is just too complex for many developers to enable reliably. So sometimes they don't get it quite right, connections fail, so it's easier for them to just disable it completely. Well, that's it for today. Thanks again for listening. If you want to meet in person, I'll be traveling quite a bit the next couple of months. Of course, Sans Fire is of the next big public event in about two weeks. I'll also be in London beginning of July, Boston end of July, and then Arlington, Virginia mid-August. If you're interested in any classes I'm teaching, just check the show notes page. I usually have links to upcoming classes right there. That's it. Thanks for listening and talk to you again on Monday. Bye.